By the time I'm finished with my talk today, another 25 murders, rapes, aggravated assaults, and robberies will be committed in the United States. There's another number that I want you to think about, 1.165 million. In 2014, the Federal Bureau of Investigations reported that there were over 1.165 million violent crimes in the US. That number should shock you. It certainly shocked me when I started working in public safety. Let's break these down a little bit. There are over 14,000 homicides, 84,000 rapes, 325,000 robberies, and over 740,000 aggravated assaults. To give those numbers a little bit more color, those rapes and those robberies were only the ones that were reported to the police. And for those of you who don't know what an aggravated assault is, the FBI describes it as one attack by a person upon another with the intent of causing aggravated or severe bodily injury. They're not petty, violent crimes. And now for the worst number there, the homicides, those numbers keep rising. Now, the numbers are still not final, but the Brennan Institute at NYU predicts that there's been an 11% increase in homicides in the United States in 2015. Everywhere from Houston and New York to Denver and Baltimore have seen murders surge. These numbers are unthinkable. I've spent the last two years of my life with the police departments. I've been at the scenes of homicides, watching as family members of victims sob uncontrollably next to the bodies of their loved ones. I've seen the aftermath of domestic violence, and I've listened to children describe the physical pain and abuse inflicted by their parents. The problem that we have with violent crime is not alone in the United States. It's everywhere in the world. We cannot accept these numbers as a constant. We cannot accept these and we cannot tolerate them. We have to work against them. We have to work to fight violent crime. What I want to turn our attention to now is the brave women and men who every single day work to fight these numbers because they don't believe that they have to be a fundamental part of our society. These are our first responders, our police officers, our firefighters, our EMTs, and our emergency dispatchers. Now, for a second, I want you to imagine what it's like to actually be a police officer. It's 10 p.m., you're about to start an eight-hour shift, you pull your car into the station, you get out, you get on your uniform, and you put on about 30 to 40 pounds of gear. That's everything from your radio, your baton, your duty belt, your service weapon, your handcuffs, your ammunition, another pair of handcuffs, a flashlight, a baton, and last but not least, your bullet-resistant vest. You go to a roll call, you get assigned a car and a beat, and then you disperse. You get in your car, and the first thing you do is you start responding to calls. They start coming in one after the other. Everything from an aggravated assault, to a robbery in progress, to shots fired, to a family disturbance. No matter what the call is, no matter what the situation is, you have to respond. You are the first line of defense. In the last four years, I've had the honor of meeting thousands of police officers in the US. If there's one thing they all have in common, is that they all respond to any situation, no matter how dangerous it is. We take for granted the fact that every single hour of every single day, we have brave women and men on our streets, patrolling our communities, fighting our fires, responding to these calls, who put their lives on the line for people they do not know and they have never met. Think about that for a second. That's an incredibly rare and precious quality in a person, yet we take that for granted. And now one might assume that because of the mission critical nature of their work, because of the importance of protecting the public, that we give these first responders the very best tools and the very best technology to get the job done. That they have things like you see in NCIS or CSI. But the fact of the matter is, that couldn't be less true. Now, in their personal lives, our police officers use everything from Spotify, Twitter, and Facebook, the beautiful applications that all of you are used to. But when they go to work, they're transported back about 20 years in time using systems that resemble things made for Windows 95. It's absolutely unacceptable, and we've let them down. Now, in an age where technological innovation and entrepreneurship are soaring, 
when engineers, product managers, and designers are flocking to Silicon Valley and New York startups, we have let our public safety technology stagnate. Across the world, failed deployments of public safety technology have resulted in felons being let out of jail, cases being thrown out of court, and people dying because their 911 or 999 calls have gotten lost in a system. Our technological infrastructure that supports our first responders is costing people their lives. So now what I want to do is walk you through two very real scenarios where our technology puts the lives of our first, off, uh, first responders at risk and our uh, lives at risk. The first one is a routine traffic stop. You're a police officer. It's a late, cold January night. The only thing you're thinking about is getting home to your family. You see someone driving and their taillights broken, so you decide you're going to pull them over. You turn on their lights and you pull the car over. The first thing you do is you run the registration plate number through a federal and local database, and after scanning through terribly formatted returns, you conclude that there's no outstanding warrants for arrests and no prior arrests as far as you can see. So you decide that you're going to exit your vehicle and approach the driver's side door cautiously. Meanwhile, the driver is anxious. Two weeks ago, and two states away, he committed an armed robbery. Now, he's thinking that that officer who just pulled him over is here to arrest him on that charge. Not wanting to go to jail, he reaches for the handgun underneath his seat and unlocks the safety. As the police officer approaches the driver's side door, he orders the driver to lower the window and put his hands on the wheel. The driver complies with the first part, but instead of putting his hands on the wheel, he raises his weapon and shoots the officer twice. Unfortunately, this is a common situation that's happened and it's avoidable. Police records existed on this suspect in multiple states showing both his violent tendencies and his erratic behavior. But the way information sharing works in law enforcement is you can commit a crime and by crossing the jurisdictional line, records of that crime may not even exist anymore. And instead of actually having free access that would protect these officers and protect the public, all of this is obfuscated by old systems that are on premise that don't share information and that don't talk to each other. By having access to this information, our police officers could fight crime better, and they could finally be able to protect themselves on the street. The second scenario I want to walk you through is one that's even more common, an emergency call. A lot of us have probably called 911 or 999 before, and we're familiar with how it works. What I want you to imagine is a woman sitting in her apartment. She starts having chest pains. At first, they don't seem that serious, but steadily they get worse. She reaches for her smartphone and dials 911. On the other end, at an emergency communication center, a call taker picks up the phone. The woman on the other end tells her that she believes she's having a heart attack. The call taker sees that this uh, call is from a cell phone. Knowing that there is no way to get an accurate location fix, she asks the woman for her location. No response. At this point, the woman can no longer talk. Again, repeatedly, the call taker asks for this woman's location. The only thing she's getting back through this antiquated system is the location of the cell tower itself. Again, there was no response. Because of this, she wasn't able to dispatch a unit, and the woman died. If you look at the way our emergency dispatch systems are set up, almost all cell phone calls have no location data attached to them. You can't text 911, you can't send images, and you can't send videos to 911. USA Today reports that in 2014, 63% of 911 calls from cell phones in California, that's about 12 million calls, had no location data attached to them. In 2008, a young woman was abducted, and while laying in the back of her kidnapper's car, she tried call calling 911. The dispatcher on the end of the line couldn't pinpoint her location and couldn't dispatch a unit. That woman was later found raped and murdered. In 2010, as a woman lay on her floor with blood filling her lungs, she had her phone next to her and dialed was 911. While the dispatchers and calls takers eagerly tried to get information out of her of her location, they weren't able to. And since they couldn't track that call, they were two hours late with the units dispatched, and the woman was found dead. The inadequacies in our public safety technology are causing people to lose their lives. The message that I want you to take away from these two scenarios is that when government is left behind, we pay the price. When we deprioritize technology for our first responders, we put our heroes' lives on the line. And when we slow down innovation that could save lives, 
we put the safety of our communities on the line. So now the question is, what needs to be done? Well, we need to fix the basics. We need to go in and completely reinvent and reimagine the way our public safety agencies collect, manage, share, and analyze data. The future of policing, of responding to emergencies in 2020 and 2025, doesn't look like something out of Minority Report. What it's about is going in and figuring out how do we take the base fundamental systems that power our first responders and bring them up to the modern standards of 2016. So now the question is, are people out there doing things to change this? The good news is, is that there are some groups and some people. You have everything from companies that are building new types of smart weapons that when an officer draws one, it alerts the police that he or she needs backup. You have companies that are building new cloud-based platforms that will finally allow officers, detectives, and investigators to share information to fight crime collaboratively. You have groups like Code for America that are working to empower technologists with resources and partnerships to solve government issues. And you have a select group of pioneering civil servants that are working every single day within our governments to change the way technology is used. But at the end of the day, the message that I want to leave you with is that we all have to get involved. The violent crime problems we have, the problems we have with our public safety infrastructure, they're not going away. They're not going away unless we start giving back to our government. Every single thing that you put in, every single thing that you contribute to a local, state, federal government, we benefit directly from that. Whether that's through volunteering, through building new technology, through work on policy or work on investing, we need to commit ourselves to helping the agencies that help us. At the end of the day, if we do that, it could very well save our lives. Thank you.